indeed. If you would please remain standing, turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew. We'll be reading verses, excuse me, chapter 23, verses 16 to 22. Matthew 23, 16 to 22. Let's pray first, though, and then we'll go to the text. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we do now come to your word, I ask that you would open our hearts and minds to receive it. Help us to understand and submit ourselves to it in the power of your most Holy Spirit. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray this. Amen. And so our Lord pronounces a third woe upon the scribes and Pharisees, and this is what he says. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and may he guard us from error in receiving it. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So once again, we come to the, this third of seven woes that Jesus pronounces against the scribes and Pharisees. Each of these woes, of course, is a declaration of God's coming judgment against them. And Jesus wants the scribes and Pharisees and the rest of the nation of Israel with them to take these woes very seriously, to take them as these warnings of judgment, so that, having received the warning, they might repent. They might turn to the Lord, seeking his forgiveness in mercy. And as we have learned, certainly in this past couple of weeks, we understand that any who calls on the Lord for mercy, will receive it. They will enter into life rather than condemnation. And so we keep the grace of God in mind even as we continue to examine these woes, this third warning that Jesus gives the scribes and Pharisees about the coming judgment of God. And as we dig into this, before we get into the real meat of it, I just want to point out that if you read through this section of, of Matthew 23, you're going to notice something different about this declaration of woe as compared to the other six. Because as we saw last week, in the first two woes, Jesus declares, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And then in the last four woes, he does the same things. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. But in today's text, in this third woe, he does something completely different. He addresses them saying, woe to you, blind guides. And then a few verses later, you blind fools. And then again, you blind men. And so we can clearly see that our Lord's emphasis is shifting a little bit, at least for this woe, not that, the, not that the Pharisees are not hypocritical, but that's not his focus now. Rather, our Lord is focusing on their blindness, their spiritual blindness, their spiritual lack of perception, the absence of any genuine understanding of the truths of God on the part of these men who were supposed to be the religious leaders of Israel. And as we've seen here, uh, like last week, the Lord uses sharp language. Not vulgar language, not crass language, but yes, very sharp language. Consider the second thing that Jesus addresses these men as when he says, you blind fools. Are there any amongst us who would respond well to that? Of course not. That is strong language. 
It is unyielding language, but purposeful language. Because that word fool, added to blind, you blind fools, puts us in mind of one of the Proverbs. Proverbs 18.2, where we read, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his own opinion. Does that not describe the Pharisees to a T here? The fact that they are blind fools. They are blind guides in that they are supposed to be teachers. They are supposed to be leading the nation of Israel toward the Lord. But the problem is they have no care or concern for actually understanding the things of the Lord. In one sense, they love the law. They love to examine it. They love to analyze it. They love to categorize it. They love to quibble and argue over it. But they have no love for actually understanding it in terms of God's truth coming from it. Rather, they take no pleasure in that understanding but in expressing their own opinions in expressing their own conclusions. And of course, therefore, devising, as we've learned before, these scribes and Pharisees coming up with all their own rules and regulations beyond the actual law of God to then foist on the people. And this is an indicator of their spiritual blindness that they're doing this. And as we get into things today, we're going to see another specific way in which they are spiritually blind. Another way, they are denying God's truths and bringing judgment on themselves. What we have here today is a surface issue that Jesus addresses specifically, and we're going to talk about that, and then an underlying issue. And the surface issue is pretty bad which just indicates all the more how serious the underlying issue actually is. So if we think in terms of headings to guide our thoughts for the rest of today, we have number one, the surface issue, and then number two, what lies beneath. We know that these men are acting as blind, as fools. Let's see how that works out in our Lord's convicting words of them here. We begin with the surface issue, the basic area of sin that Jesus specifically addresses, because he says to them, woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. So the surface issue, the, the thing that, that is, is clear is the matter of oaths and vows. Now, we don't, in my experience at least, take those types of things very serious nowadays. We don't use oaths and vows in the way that many people did uh, at that time, certainly not the way that the scribes and Pharisees were doing. But Jesus, in describing this, and as he goes through the rest of the passage, describes an actual system a formulaic, systematized way of declaring an oath or making a vow. And of course, the scribes and Pharisees were dictating how that system worked. And what they were doing in this system, in these rules and regulations governing how you take a vow, is they were creating loopholes so that they themselves could make a vow and get all the benefits of making the vow but then not have to follow through with it. Because think about it. When you vow to somebody, well, you get them to believe you, right? They take you seriously because you give them an oath. And you can use that to gain influence over people. You can get them to do what you want because you're promising that you will do whatever in response. Also, especially as religious leaders, it looks very pious, to make a vow, to swear on the temple, right? It makes you look extra religious. And the scribes and Pharisees were all about that. And so they were doing these things, but in their system, they made linguistic distinctions, which means if you said this, you had to keep the vow. But if you knew the right words, 
you could say this, and it would still sound good, and you could make the vow, but you wouldn't actually have to keep it. So they could benefit on both sides. Now you might remember from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus actually talked about vows and oaths himself. And he came to a very simple conclusion. He said, do not take an oath at all. He cut out all of this junk. Do not take an oath at all. Rather, in a few verses later, he says, let what you say be simply yes or no. In other words, we are to take things like truth and honesty and integrity seriously enough that we simply do what we say we're going to do and that we get the reputation for that. And so the, the way, if you want to think of it this way, to get people to think highly of you is not to make this grandiose vow. It's simply to keep your normal word on a consistent basis throughout your life. That's what Jesus wants his people to do, which makes perfect sense because Jesus, his people, those who belong to him, are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, right? And, and what else, what other name is given to the Holy Spirit? but the spirit of truth. And so if the spirit of truth dwells within us, then it would only make sense that our speech would reflect that same truth in whatever we say. So, of course, if the scribes and Pharisees had submitted themselves to that basic principle, none of this would be an issue. But sadly, they were not willing to do that, of course, because as we've already seen, as blind guides, they weren't interested in understanding what ought to have been by God's standard. They rather only wanted to do their own thing. And so in today's text, we see that even though Jesus has already dealt with this in the Sermon on the Mount, they have done their own thing. And so Jesus is going to examine what they have done. This whole system of vows and oaths and, and all the convoluted hidden loopholes shouldn't have existed in the first place. But Jesus is actually going to take the time to interact with it as is for one simple reason. To use it against the scribes and Pharisees who created it. He is going to take their own system to demonstrate just how spiritually blind they are, and unfortunately with that, just how worthy of receiving God's judgment they are. So let's look at this system that they've created based on the examples that Jesus gives us. I would call their system one, uh, this is not a theological term, you won't find it in commentaries, but I call it the, the hierarchy of seriousness. Okay, whatever is most serious, that's what you're going to pay attention to in general. That wouldn't seem to make sense. But here we have for their vows, they say if you swear an oath by the temple, well, in their thinking, that wasn't very serious, so you didn't need to keep the vow. You could still make it. Okay? You could still impress people by saying, I swear by the temple, but because you were swearing by the temple, that, wasn't, that didn't really do it, so that was uh, a vow that you didn't have to worry about keeping. But if you swore an oath by the gold of the temple in their system, well, that was serious. So if you swore by the gold of the temple, that was binding, and you had to keep that oath, otherwise face some sort of consequences. Similarly, as, as Jesus goes on to give the example of verse 18, if you swore by the altar, okay, the alt altar there in the temple, again, that wasn't that serious. But if you swore by the gift on the altar, that was serious. So you need to keep that vow as opposed to the other one. And having just explained the basic system to you, I ask you to think in your own heart and mind, how do you react to that? How does, how does that feel to you? How does that come across? This idea of swear by the temple, meaningless. But the gold in the temple, now it's binding. Swear by the altar, not that big of a deal. Swear by the gift on the altar, big deal. How does that sit with us today? Because in my mind, and I admit I'm thinking at a very, very simple level here, but on my mind, if you say, I vow or I swear to do X, Y, or Z, then it doesn't really matter what you swear by. You've still said, I vow, I swear. I swear. 
I promise, I commit. Or even the simple phrase, I will. Did you realize that that is in the same category as a vow? I will. You're making a commitment to do whatever you just said, I will. But then to say, well, you can add some words after it, and if you use the right words, it just invalidates everything that comes before, so you don't actually have to do what you just committed to do. Especially when that system seemed to be convoluted enough that people who weren't in the know as to what, what phrases were powerful and which phrases weren't powerful is very easy to deceive people. You could get people to listen to you and to depend on the commitment you made by swearing that vow. But then, of course, if you did it correctly, you didn't actually have to follow through. And what that means in the end is they were simply trying to legitimize a process of deception. They're just trying to um, formulize, for, formulate and, and, and codify a way to lie to people. Now, hopefully kids don't do this today. Hopefully kids didn't do this when you were a kid in your circles. But I remember it, as a kid, this thing called crossing your fingers behind your back existed where you could make a promise, make a commitment, and then when you failed to come through with your commitment, you could just say, ha ha, I had my fingers crossed behind my back. It didn't count. That's essentially uh, what the scribes and Pharisees are doing here. They're just doing it in a much more uh, uh, fancy way. But what it comes down to is simply finding a way to lie to people and gain benefit yourself. And again, this just shows how blind, how spiritually blind they are. Because what is one of the big commandments? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Okay? It's very easy. It's very simple. It's right there. And they certainly knew that commandment. Even more so, maybe not quite as well known as that big commandment, but Proverbs 12, 20, 22 states, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Now, you can put lipstick on lying lips. In other words, you can dress it up all fancy. You can say, but my fingers were crossed behind my back. But the truth is that the scribes and Pharisees were formalizing a system of deception, legitimizing lying lips, even though that was an abomination before God. And the way this really demonstrates how spiritually blind these men were is because they considered themselves righteous. And not in the way that we would say that any one of us is righteous because, as we saw from our confession of faith, we are righteous because of Christ's righteousness imputed to us, placed on us. It's not our own. No, they said, nope, my righteousness is there and it's mine. They would look at the nations around them, the pagan, heathen nations around them, and they would say, we don't engage in worshiping idols of wood or stone. We don't engage in, in uh, uh, sorcery or, or uh, necromancy or mediumship or any of that stuff. We, we don't engage in, at least outwardly, sexual immorality that ran rampant in the heathen world. And as far as that goes, that's true. But they were committing the abomination of lying and making their lies official in the system of vows. So they were not righteous, not even a little bit. They were committing abominations just like the nations around them. They were spiritually blind to it, though. And as we consider this for ourselves today, it's my hope that we would be willing to examine ourselves and ask God to open our eyes to help us to perceive any spiritual blindness that afflicts us as well. Because, of course, we can look at the world around us and we can see many things that are abominable in the sight of our holy God. 
And yes, we should warn people about the judgment brought about by those abominations. But can we do that without examining ourselves first and repenting of any of the things that may be in our own lives that are just as offensive to God? Because as our Lord says in Matthew 7, it is only when we take the plank out of our own eye that we will be able to see that our own spiritual blindness will be taken care of and then we can help others. Amen? There's something more to this, obviously. Things keep on getting deeper here as we consider what the scribes and Pharisees were doing because this system, this uh, abomination of a system of, of, of uh, oaths and vows that allowed them to deceive people was bad in and of itself, obviously, and worthy of judgment. But even as we consider their own hierarchy of seriousness, we see just how twisted and upside down their priorities actually were. Because once again, in, in their own estimation of what made a vow serious, they neglected the temple itself and focused on the gold inside the temple. Now when it came to the permanent temple, there was actually a lot of gold inside the temple. The walls were lined with thin plates of gold. But there was also the golden candlestick. There was the golden implements. There was gold everywhere in there. Okay? But they, didn't, they focused on the individual items of gold rather than the temple itself. Same thing, not about the altar, but whatever was placed on the altar. And in light of that series of priorities, Jesus says, you blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? You blind men, which is greater, the gift on the altar or the altar which makes the gift sacred? And we, from his explanation, it becomes very clear. It's not the thing that gets placed on the altar or the thing that, that is brought into the temple that is of greater importance or greater significance. It's the temple and the altar which are already holy, and it's for their sake that these other things are then made holy. And the really sad part here, when it comes up to the mixed up priorities of the scribes and Pharisees, is again, they, they claim to be experts in the law, and they could have seen this in the law itself. In Exodus 29, 37, God is giving instructions for the, the establishment of the tabernacle, of his dwelling place with man. And in part we read, seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it, and the altar shall be made holy. So the materials for the altar were not holy by default. They had to make them holy through this process given to them by God. But once that was done, listen to what happens next. Then whatever touches the altar shall become holy. That right there clearly explains the priority in God's own word, the law, of which one was more holy, which one was greater. That if there was going to be a system of vows based on a hierarchy, and there shouldn't have been in the first place, but even if there was going to be, that would be what you put your vow, uh, the weight of your vow in. Not the gold, not the gift, but the temple, the altar, because God makes it clear. He sanctifies those things. And then holiness gets applied to whatever touches them. But the point here isn't, again, that they had a decent or legitimate system. They just got some of the details backward. The point is that this demonstrates where their priorities are here. Because they're not even seeing what the Scripture says right in front of them about what is important and what is closest to God. Therefore, despite their credentials, despite their great learning and their expertise, and they were experts in the law in many ways, despite the authority and influence they had over the people in the culture, again, 
Proverbs 18.2, they did not actually care about understanding the truths of God, much less submitting to them themselves or passing them on to others. They were not concerned with the truth, the objective truth of God. They only cared about making their own thoughts and opinions known. They used an argument of authority. Do this because of authority. But whose authority? God's authority? No. Their own authority. Which actually draws us deeper to that underlying problem. To what lies beneath for our second heading. Because once again, we've, we're seeing here, we saw it last week, we're seeing it some more, and we're going to see it more in the coming weeks. It might be kind of rough to get through. I, I apologize for that, but it's, it's what we're going to do. It's in God's Word. The scribes and Pharisees were simply not submitting themselves to God. They were the religious leaders of the nation of Israel claiming to be the people of God, and yet they were not submitting themselves to Him. They were disconnected from God. We see this once again in that hierarchy of priorities because they didn't want people to swear. Or if the people did swear by the temple, they said that wasn't very serious. You didn't have to keep it. But again, the lesser thing, the gold or the stuff on the altar, that's the serious thing. Which means they were putting the emphasis and the importance on things that were literally farther away from God. Jesus explains himself, whoever swears by the temple, and that's their oath that doesn't mean anything to them, but Jesus says, whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. Why do you think they did not take it seriously to swear on the temple? Because they were disconnected from God. They didn't care. They were far more concerned with the physical things, the expensive things, gold and the expensive gifts the sacrifices that were placed because they had more to do with them rather than god and so as they did this and as they taught others to do this they created distance between themselves and god therefore jesus is now forced in his explanation to show that you can't just go around separating all the elements of the temple into these little categories and then divorcing them from god which is unfortunately exactly what the scribes and pharisees were doing because again they wanted to make their oaths they wanted to sway people to gain influence to get people to do what they wanted them to to look pious as they did it but they wanted to do it all without submitting to god and if they found a way to do what they wanted to without submitting to god without taking his standard into the equation then they could literally do whatever they wanted to do that's the whole point of removing God from the equation. Not only for the scribes and Pharisees, but for us today. If we can remove God from the equation, we get to do whatever we want to. At least that's what we convince ourselves of. And what happens as a response to that? Well, we can rationalize anything. When we separate ourselves from God, we can make ourselves believe anything we want. And that's what they were doing. And unfortunately, as we see that being the case with the scribes and the Pharisees, this disconnect from God, we see that our Lord's description of them is all the more validated. Because we think of that word fool again. He called them blind fools. And in Psalm 14, the first verse, David writes this, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The next line, they, meaning the fool, they are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. Once again, is this not a description of the scribes and Pharisees themselves? Obviously, with their lying lips, they would never verbally declare that there is no God. They would always vehemently claim that they were servants of God. But that's not what David says. David does not say the fool says with his lips, there is no God. He says the fool says in his heart, there is no God. 
And that's what the scribes and Pharisees were doing through their actions of what was coming out of them, which proceeded from their heart. They, they could declare whatever they wanted to with their lips, with their lying lips. But they were demonstrating that in their heart, there was, they, they believed there was no God. They were living as if there was no God, which means they were indeed fools. By David's definition and by our Lord's description. And not only that, but David went on to say that fools are corrupt, doing abominable deeds. We may think sometimes in a very unprecise way that a fool is just someone who doesn't know anything. Or a fool is someone who just acts bizarrely. No, a fool is the one who rebels against God and who does exactly the opposite of God's goodness and righteousness. And unfortunately, that's what these very learned men who knew lots about lots of things, they had become fools because they were literally legitimizing lying lips and formalizing abominations. In all of this, they were rejecting God, even as they claimed to be the teachers of God's truth. They were opposing God. They had turned good for evil, light for dark, sweet for bitter. And this, of course, is why Jesus is pronouncing this woe upon them, why it is that severe judgment is coming. They may be affirming him with their lying lips, but they are denying him in their hearts. And as we think about this judgment, we again return in our minds to Romans 1. We talked about it last week, I believe, about the fact that people suppress the truth. But here, once again, we have the teachers of Israel. These are the people that God gave his oracles to. He gave them the express truth through the prophets directly from himself. These were not people that were simply suppressing a truth that they saw in the stars or in nature around them about the eternal power uh, and divine nature of God. Rather, these people had received the explicit truth of God from God, and yet we see them uh, suppressing that truth as vigorously as any of the pagan nations around them. And therefore, their hearts, which were already foolish, were further darkened. And claiming to be wise, they became fools, as the Apostle Paul says. And the reason why I belabor this point is because this is what happens for all of us. Whether you are a Jewish person or a Gentile person, if we reject and disconnect ourselves from the truth of God, if we care not for understanding, if we care only for our own thoughts, our own opinions, demanding that we and others live according to them, we will be spiritually blind. We will become fools, disconnected from God, disconnected from reality itself. And I know that this is strong language, but I'm going to say it again here. I'm going to use the word. I hope you know what I mean. When we do look at the world around us, do we see fools who have disconnected themselves from God and therefore disconnected themselves from reality? We do. But do you know what? We don't have to look only at the world out there. Again, the scribes and Pharisees made themselves feel so much better, and they, they really anchored the idea of their own righteousness by looking at the world out there. But remember, the judgment, this woe was coming upon them for their spiritual blindness, and they were not political leaders in the world. You know, because when we think about, oh, what, what, where are the fools in our world? Where are the spiritually blind guides in our world? Well, the political leaders, the cultural influencers, they're so far off base. And sure, it's true. <clears throat> when it comes to God's judgment, we, there's a target-rich environment. But the point of this passage is that the, the woe, the judgment is coming not against secular political leaders or secular cultural influencers. 
It's coming against the scribes and Pharisees who were the leaders in the visible church of that day. So again, like we mentioned before, before we look at the nations and the world, let our attentions be drawn to the church. Are there people in the church who have impressive credentials, vast amounts of learning, great authority and influence over many people, and yet they are in that same role as blind guides and even blind fools. And when I say the church, and examine the church, I mean the wider church, but also examining ourselves. That our leaders here would not be blind guides. We would be examining ourselves often so that we do not puff ourselves up and give to people our own opinions, our own thoughts, and demand that that be followed as if it was God's truth. Because if we allow that to happen for ourselves, or if we consider how that it happens in the broader Christian community, that is when we see religious leaders turning good for evil and evil good switching light for darkness and dark to light to light and sweet considering what is sweet to be bitter and claiming that what is actually bitter should be considered sweet if this is or for those people where that is the case they are following in the footsteps of the scribes and pharisees and again may that never be us Let's examine ourselves to make sure it is not us. But for those people, like we learned last week, they are not in God's kingdom, and they're actually preventing others from joining God's kingdom. And God's judgment will come upon them. But as quickly as I can after making that statement, I also ask this, is that where we just leave it for today? Do we simply say they are wicked They are practicing abomination. Therefore, they are under judgment and good riddance. Is that where we leave it? No. No, we do not say they are children of wrath and we are content for them to stay children of wrath. Rather, we heed the words of Jude where he writes, have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. In other words, yes, hate wickedness and guard yourself from falling into the same spiritual blindness that that is caused by that wickedness. Guard yourself even as you reach out to those people who are spiritually blind, but do reach out. Do reach out to them. Snatch them out of the fire. Which is to say, which is to indicate that right up until the moment of condemnation, there is still hope for God's grace. Yes, it is true. There is a line that once crossed cannot be uncrossed. The line of no return is a real thing. And that line might be somewhere even before a person's death. There might be a line of, uh, 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 of no return where a person is just apostatized and the Lord just finishes off, off with a hard heart. But until that line is crossed, until judgment is declared, there is still the opportunity for grace and salvation. Therefore, we should be declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ that people would repent of their sins and turn to Christ in faith and so be saved at every point in time. Because we don't know where that line is. And so as we move to a conclusion here, we need to understand why judgment is coming. Okay. And I, I mentioned it before, part of me wants to apologize that we have several more weeks 
of working through our Lord's woes against the Pharisees, and none of it is fun to consider, but these are the words and the warnings of Jesus Christ himself. And so we must understand the reality of God's judgment, and we must understand why judgment comes. But gloriously, the scriptures also direct us to consider the reality of his grace and forgiveness, and and the abundance and the eagerness with which God does forgive people and give them genuine salvation. And that even the worst of the wicked, if they but call on the name of Jesus, will be saved. And so it is my prayer that we here in this place would be a people who are eager to snatch people from the fire. As the old translation goes, to pluck brands from the burning. To snatch people out of judgment itself if the Lord allows. Let us be men and women who are willing to look past the sin and the shame and the yuck that cakes people's lives to understand the truth that there might be one of God's sheep under there. And that we would, yes, proclaim to them the warning of God's judgment, but we would also proclaim to them the message of God's salvation. So that wherever the sheep may be under all of that gunk, they would hear the voice of their shepherd, the word of Christ, and turn and follow him. Amen? Amen. I love you all. That's why I bring you this message in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, you are gracious. You are so gracious, Father. In this very moment, you are gracious and glorious beyond our ability to comprehend or express. We praise you and we thank you for the incredible salvation that you've provided. And we ask that you would help us now in light of your word to understand all the truths you've revealed to us, both concerning sin and its consequences, as well as salvation that comes by grace through faith in Christ. Help us, Father, to be courageous in taking both the warning and the message, the gospel, to all those who need to hear it. It's in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.